Hey folks, welcome to a special episode of Passion for Sound. This week I was lucky enough to be invited to the Australian launch of the PS Audio FR30 speakers. Yes, speakers. And that's why this is a special video. This unfortunately doesn't mark the beginning of a whole lot of speaker reviews on Passion for Sound. I'm still not set up to do that. But with some cooperation and collaboration with Jeff from Hey Now Hi-Fi, I do hope to bring you a bit of extra different content in the future. And I want to start off this video by saying a huge thanks to Jeff from Hey Now Hi-Fi for inviting me along to the launch and allowing me to hear these wonderful speakers and also to share them with all of you. If you're not familiar with Hey Now Hi-Fi, Jeff's been running it now for a couple of years, I think two to three years, and he's a wonderful person to deal with, very easy to talk to, provides excellent unbiased advice about the gear he carries, of course. And so if you're in Australia and looking for Hi-Fi gear and you're not already aware of Hey Now Hi-Fi, do check out their website. I'll put a link down below. They're going to be carrying the FR30 speakers and of course a whole lot of other brands as well. To be clear, this video is not sponsored in any way by Hey Now Hi-Fi. I'm just really grateful for the chance to go along and check out the FR30s. The way I'm going to present this video, because I'm not really a speaker reviewer as such, is that I'm going to share with you shortly the presentation on the night at the launch from Peter from Magenta Audio. They're the distributors of PS Audio here in Australia. And so Peter's going to go into detail about the design of the speakers, some of the technology that's gone into them, and what makes them special. I'll then, after that, share with you my thoughts on what I heard from the speakers, as well as my summary of what some others had to say about the sound. Before I say any more though, let me get out of the way and let Peter from Magenta Audio introduce you to the PS Audio FR30 loudspeakers. Well, welcome tonight, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for uh, the Australian launch of these new PS Audio loudspeakers. You're one of a select group of people. There are only six of these loudspeakers in existence at the moment, and you're one of the first groups in the world to hear it. Paul McGowan is probably quite famous for exposing his development process to the public. He talks at great length about how he's developing his products, where they are, how, how long they'll be before they get to market. And you're probably all well aware that uh, this loudspeaker is many, many years in the making. Uh, there were a couple of false starts. Um, the process was very close to completion on a couple of occasions and Paul decided that he just couldn't put his name to it. So with this particular process they went back to a clean sheet of paper and started with a brand new design brief because they weren't happy that although it sounded great and the production guys were ready to take it to production, Paul wasn't happy that it should bear the PS Audio name. So the design brief really was to create a loudspeaker that was capable of delivering the dynamics and the engagement of live music. Now that's a really tough ask, you know, it, it's what everybody so-called aims to achieve, but a lot of loudspeakers fall a long way short. And with this clean sheet of paper approach, they started with a philosophical decision. How do we get the most dynamic loudspeaker possible? So you can start by designing a loudspeaker around a given set of drivers. You can pick a set of drivers, you can match them together, you can build a cabinet around them, build crossovers and put a system out but you're always going to be struggling with the inherent flaws of each driver because they're not specifically matched together and they're somewhat of a general driver. So with this approach, what they decided to do was go back to scratch. And they said, if we want the most dynamic driver possible, how can we do that? So they went for planar magnetics. And the reason for doing that was that they are lighter than air. So you start with that approach. We're going to have a planar magnetic based system so then what are the other design elements that need to go with that? Typically a planar, large panels, they are bipoles. They radiate from the front and the rear as the membrane moves. But if you're gonna mate that with a conventional woofer that has only a forward propagating sound field, then there's some discontinuities in the sound field. So what they decided specifically to do was only to go from monopole, forward radiating, mid and treble section. Now, to give an air of spaciousness, there is also a high frequency driver on the back. Um, it is not a major component of the sound, but it does add to the spaciousness and the realism of the sound. So starting with this approach, monopole, planar magnetic, and then conventional bass. But then there are some significant issues about making those two sets of technology work together. And, and ultimately, when you start from scratch and design your own drivers, you have the capability then of designing a family of loudspeakers around that. So there will be a reference speaker bigger than this, and I believe there'll be two that come down below this in size and price. So with the planar magnetic, 
What you're trying to do here is design a driver that is lighter than air. Now these are typically made of Kapton tape, it's a folded Kapton tape and it has a series of electrical traces that are printed onto it and then that is suspended within a magnetic field and as the current flows through the traces the driver moves. Now the driver itself being Kapton is lighter than the air that it displaces. So what you have is a system that has essentially no mass can start and stop almost instantaneously and give you amazing dynamics in the music. And they typically work best for the high frequency components and through the vocal range. Then you consider how you mate that to the rest of the system. There are some significant challenges in that. But before I go there, I want to talk about why you would also choose that type of driver. Not only do you have an, an instantly moving driver because it's essentially massless, but you avoid a lot of the issues that you get with a conventional driver. There's no support structure. The membrane itself is the driving surface and it is suspended by the air as it moves. In a conventional driver you have a voice coil and you have a former and the voice coil is wrapped around that and then you have a spider and you have a cone assembly, you have a dust cap and a, and a surround and, and the basket that it's all held within. And all of those components have their own magnetic or have their own mechanical resonances. So they all want to vibrate at their own frequencies. And you also have some translational losses. As you energize the voice coil, it starts to move, but it's not perfectly stiff. And so you lose some of that energy in that initial motion before it gets to the cone and the surround. And so it's not a perfectly matched transducer. So a lot of reasons you would go towards this type of driver. Um, the other reason, <coughs> excuse me, is that a planar magnetic is effectively a resistive load. Um, it's essentially just a couple of turns uh, of trace sitting within that magnetic field. Now, if you have a resistive load, a resistive load is the ideal. Uh, any reactive load, be it uh, capacitive or inductive load, it has a phase change uh, with the applied signal. What that means essentially is that as the electricity, as the field builds up, it takes a period of time before the coil or the coil actually starts to move. So you have a time delay, a phase offset, and those things actually become audible in the sound field. So you want to get rid of that as much as possible. It's not as significant down in the base, uh, but in the, the upper frequencies, it can be quite audible. Planar magnetics also are very sensitive. Uh, there's 94 dB sensitivity here, so this panel can be driven with a very low power amplifier. Um, if you've got a great big power amplifier like the BHKs, great, it's got plenty of headroom. But at normal listening levels, it's really idling along. There's not much stress on the system. And the beauty of that is it's operating with its linear, within its linear range. So that you're not going to be stressing it at the bounds of its performance under normal listening levels. The other aspect for this particular driver is you notice the, the narrow aspect of the aperture. And that actually provides better horizontal dispersion. These types of drivers, they tend to radiate directly out and you avoid the first reflections from the floor and the ceiling that provide a lot of coloration to the sound. And the narrow aperture actually allows you to disperse the sound field more evenly in the room. So what you'll notice as you, as you listen tonight is that yes, it does sound fantastic on axis, but as you move around the room, you probably won't notice much difference. And that's because it's filling the room quite uniformly. You know, every room has nodes. Every room has lumps and bumps in the frequency range and you go in the corner and you hear a bit of a boom. But it's less so when you've got a driver like this that has a nice horizontal dispersion. So again, another bonus for going down this pathway. And again, the other thing is it'll give you really stable and precise imaging. So how do you then incorporate this type of driver, which is almost massless and has instantaneous performance, with a conventional driver that has all of the inherent issues that I mentioned previously. Well, those issues aren't as significant when you get into the base region, but the drivers are still very slow because generally they're quite massive and they have all of these structures around them. So PS Audio, again, started from a clean sheet of paper with the woofer and they've designed a system that has very long magnet extension. The motor assembly is quite long. It's a split magnetic field. So what that gives them is the ability to drive very long excursions. Um, most of the distortion in a woofer comes at the extremities of its excursion. So typically a woofer has 20% distortion at X max, at the, the end of its travel. So 
this system is designed to operate again in that linear range, so we're not running into those distortions. Um, the coil inductance is a big issue. As I said before, any inductive load is an impedance to driving a quick signal. So the coil has been designed with a whole range of features, one of which is a Faraday ring. And the Faraday ring is it's almost like a shorted turn that sits in the transformer of the voice coil. And what that does is it creates a more uniform dynamic magnetic field. So it gives you the ability to drive long excursions and not to suffer from dips in the magnetic field due to the back EMF that's occurring as the driver is moving. Um, there are, there's a double spider assembly here, again, for lightness and balance and to keep the system operating nicely. Um, really, the, the hallmark of this driver is that it's incredibly light, it's stiff, and the, the low inductance actually allows it to drive very quickly. Uh, final point about this particular driver, it's actually a spun aluminium cone, uh, again, for stiffness and lightness. Um, and it, if you design it properly, then you're not going to run into those resonances. And ideally, as a system, you can design a whole range of parameters in and around these things so that there's some balancing effect and you can avoid a lot of the problems in the system. So ultimately, you have an incredibly fast woofer because these things almost operate instantaneously. You need the woofer to work accordingly. So again, philosophically, clean sheet of paper, how do you go about doing this? You have this monopole that operates very fast you now have a base unit that is incredibly fast, but how do you make them together? What type of arrangement do you choose? Well, a sealed box, an infinite baffle design, is potentially an ideal. You know, you have great response, but the base is terrible until you get to absolutely massive boxes. The internal volume needed is enormous. So the conventional way of going around that is to put a ported enclosure. And the port lowers the resonant, There's, it creates a resonant frequency at a lower point than is normally available with the box, and it extends the base response. There are a couple of other ways to do it. You could have a transmission line, or you could have a passive radiator, as with this particular design. And all of those things aim to give you greater base extension, but there are compromises with every one of those designs. The typical design chosen is a ported enclosure, a base reflex design. The reason that's chosen is because it's the easiest to get right. Essentially, it's a hole in the tube, it's a hole in the enclosure with a tuned port. The problem though is that at high excursion, you can almost hear the, there's a bit of a chuffing sound. You can, almost like a bit of an organ pipe. You can hear that under certain circumstances. And then there are also additional resonances that those components have themselves and they add color to the sound. What Pierce Audio have done here is they've created, again, their own bespoke driver here. The way to get the same type of response, base response, out of a passive radiator is to have a highly compliant device. It's very compliant, it has low mass, it operates very quickly. So you get the benefits of a base reflex design, but you avoid all of the shortcomings. Um, the other thing with this enclosure is that the uh, Base, the, the radiators are symmetrically opposed, so again, you're going to be minimising vibrations within the cabinet and resonances within what is otherwise a very stiff, highly braced cabinet. So in terms of industrial design though, everything you see on this loudspeaker has a, an acoustic function. It's not just a pretty box housing some drivers. The cabinet itself is highly damped, highly braced, it's a rigid structure. The front of the enclosure actually has a gentle curve and the reason for doing that is that at the corners of every enclosure you get diffraction occurring and the diffraction affects the sound. It causes frequencies to be transmitted out into the room and, and they can excite room nodes. So what you try and do here is you try and soften all those curves. Um, what you have here for the mid and the high, as I said you've got this narrow aperture but it's a, it's a slightly flared it's almost horn-like in its arrangement. So again, that aids in the dispersion. The material chosen for the baffle, it's a very dense material. It's a, a resin-based um, uh, material, very dense and highly damped. Again, you're trying to stop those resonances within the system. And it all sits on a solid, mechanically stable base, uh, which in uh, production units, I believe, is going to have some adjustments so it can be angled and directed 
uh, more t towards the seating position. Everyone asks about crossovers. Um, in my opinion, <coughs> there's too much talk about crossovers. A properly designed crossover should not even be considered in the situation. You know, it's one of those things that everyone wants to know about, but a properly designed crossover should almost be transparent to your ears. The key here is that there's air cord inductors. That basically means that we're going to have um, high power handling with the inductors and all the resistors are wire wound resistors, all the caps are metal film uh, plastic caps. The best components available. It's actually a fourth order acoustic um, crossover if anyone's interested and it's done with second and third order electrical filters. So in essence what we have here is a study in engineering. You know what they've decided to do is create a loudspeaker that has a clear design brief of being dynamic and engaging, moving an awful lot of air down in the base, but they started from that clean sheet of paper and said if we want to achieve our goal let's take a philosophical decision first. How do we want to start with our high frequencies? Because that really conveys most of the information, most of the emotion of music. And from there, how do we match that to every other component in the system? And once they decided that, they set about designing every single component themselves so that it was a true system. And at the end of the day, that's what this is. It's a system. It's not an aggregation of components put in a pretty box. What do you mean by the spinal aluminium drivers? Oh, okay. So, um, to spin aluminium, what you essentially do is you get a sheet of aluminium and, and it's in a lathe arrangement and you have a series of rollers that roll that against a mandrel. So there are a couple of ways you could produce this. You could actually stamp it out of a flat sheet or you could put it against a mandrel and slowly roll it into the right shape. Now, when you're rolling it, what you're effectively doing is you're flowing the material. Rather than pressing it, it flows gently into the shape you want. Um, it's kind of like a cold rolling process and it becomes a much better uh, product. But also, that's the same way you produce the flare on the end of the trumpet. You take the trumpet tube, you flare it out against the mandrel, um, and, and that's how musical instruments are made. So it's the same basic technology. In terms of the suitability of these speakers for, to say, this room here, yeah. you're saying there's going to be the reference and then a couple of smaller models. Mm -hmm. So how would you say these suit a room like this, or what would you say these would be suitable for? Um, I would say this is probably as small a room as you'd want to put these in. Yeah. I don't know, Jeff's been playing them around in this room more than I have. Yeah. Um, they work very well in this room. They don't tend to excite, excite nodes in the room. What you'll find as you move around the room, they're actually very livable. Okay. A lot of loudspeakers, you have to kind of sit in, in the hot spot, you have to have your head in a vice, and they only work there. And, yeah. and these speakers work really nicely if you're just living your life. You have your music going, you're not sitting in the hot spot all the time. But living your life and moving around the room, you'll notice that they're actually very uniform in the way they present sound. Okay. And so for me, that's the hallmark of a good loudspeaker because I don't want to be sitting in one spot listening all the time. When you want to do your critical listening, they're stunning. But they don't really compromise for that life. I won't say lifestyle is the wrong word, but, but the way you live your life. All right, well, I'll get out of the way and you can listen to some music and feel free to, to have a chat later if you want. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. As you hopefully gathered from that presentation, the FR30s are a pretty special speaker in the sense that they are all custom made in terms of all the drivers are custom made, the casing is custom made, the general design of it is all brand new. So everything about them has been built from the ground up. Having not been heavily into speakers for quite some time now, I don't really have a reference point to say how they compare to other speakers around the same price point, which by the way, is about 50,000 Australian dollars. And so what I'm gonna share with you are my general impressions, but also some talk about some of the impressions of others that attended the event. Now I did capture some footage of some of you talking about the speakers, but unfortunately the background noise has just made some of the footage unusable. So thank you to those that did speak to me and speak to camera, and I apologize that I can't share that footage here. What I have done though, is taken into account all of the opinions that were shared with me, and I'm gonna talk about those now. But I'm gonna start mostly with my direct impressions of the speakers. What first struck me upon hearing the FR30s was the ability that they have to fill the room 
without necessarily having a very, very tight point of focus for a specific listening position. And what I mean by that is you can move around the room, and Peter spoke about this in his intro, you can move around the room very easily and enjoy the speaker wherever you are. There is definitely a sweet spot, obviously dead center, a decent distance from the speakers, maybe sort of two meters from the speakers. There's definitely a sweet spot there, but it's not one of those sweet spots where if you move just, you know, 30 centimeters to the left or the right, you lose the sense of imaging and soundstage. These are a speaker where for most of the listening I did, I was standing up and moving around the room and they always sounded great. And that's something I do appreciate about them. On the flip side though, as with everything in audio, there is a bit of a trade-off you're not getting a razor sharp focused image even when you're in the sweet spot in the way that some other speakers can. As one person I spoke to at the event mentioned, they don't give you that sense that you're necessarily hearing someone in the room with you. But on the other hand, they're sounding fantastic no matter where you are in the room. And to me, that's really important. There's going to be some people that want a pair of speakers for a dedicated listening seat in a dedicated listening room, and they're probably going to want that razor sharp image focus. And in that case, I don't think the FR30s are a good fit. But if you're looking for an amazing pair of speakers that sound wonderful across the whole frequency range and are very easy to have playing no matter where you are in the room, no matter what you're doing, no matter how many people are in the room, that's where I do find the FR30s to really excel. I described the overall sound and keeping in mind that the source chain we were using for these included the Aqua Formula DAC, which is a high level R2R DAC. So it's got a slightly smoother, more musical sound compared to say our Delta Sigma DAC that might be used by some people. So we started off with a very musical, slightly smooth sounding DAC, and then that was connected up to a PS Audio preamp and a pair of PS Audio mono blocks. I apologize that I don't have notes of the different model numbers that we used here. I'll have a chat to Jeff and maybe he can pop down in the comments below exactly which models were being used. But my key point here is some of what I'm going to describe here will be about the devices that were driving the speakers as well as of course the speakers and the room that they are in. And I say that because what I heard from the FR30s was what I would describe as a smooth and a rich sound, but not one that's lacking in detail. Also not one that goes overly warm or overly thick, so much as just rich and with a good sense of harmonics. Sounds like pianos in particular are very, very enjoyable and most importantly, very lifelike from the FR30s. That's what I enjoyed most about them. I also found vocals to have a lovely sense of balance between the depth and the richness of the voice, whether it was a male or a female vocal, but also a sense of texture and airiness when needed as well. I feel like percussive sounds like drum kits, for instance, had an excellent sense of tonal balance across the entire range of their frequencies. So cymbals sounded speedy and snappy, and they had a great sense of shimmer. But then at the other end of the scale, kick basses and tom-toms had a nice sense of presence and authority as well. The room that we were in was probably only just big enough for these particular speakers because they are a large speaker. And so I did feel like occasionally the bass would get just a little bit slow, not in terms of the leading edges of the bass, but I think more the resonance in the room. And as I said before, it's worth keeping in mind here that I'm not a speaker guy. I'm deeply and heavily involved in headphones these days, but I'm very distant from the world of speakers. So I don't really have a reference point other than what I'm used to hearing on many of these tracks through headphones. So in headphones, we have no room interactions. Everything is just the sound direct from the driver into the space in the cups and around your ears with none of the reflections off walls. And so my assumption with the FR30s is that on the occasional track, and I can't stress enough, it was very, very occasional. On the occasional track, I did feel like there was a bit of extra bloom in the bass, but I would say with 99% certainty that it was the room causing that and not the speaker. And I say that because it came and went with certain frequencies and certain recordings. What I actually heard most from the speaker was a wonderfully crisp, tight and clean sound that never got sterile, never got overly clinical and was just wonderfully musical and enjoyable overall. They're a speaker that kind of makes it sound like you're in the room with the band because they cover all of the frequency ranges with a really nice tonality. But as I said before, they don't quite reach the point of tricking you into thinking that the singer's actually standing there so much as replicating the experience of maybe being busy chatting to friends while the band is in the room. So it sounds lifelike and realistic, even though it doesn't necessarily precisely image. And I really hope that doesn't come across like anything negative because I think these are a wonderful pair of speakers for those looking for a great sound while they're going about their life. 
going back to what I said before, they're not a speaker I think I'd recommend to somebody were they looking to sit in one position and focus in on the music. I think you probably could do better. But for a speaker that sounds great across a whole range of genres while you go about your life and enjoy top quality music, I think they're fantastic. I've talked a bit about the imaging qualities and that lack of razor sharp focus, but I do want to make it really clear, I think they've got a wonderful sense of overall soundstage space and particularly depth. Listening to a whole range of tracks on the couple of nights that I was at the launch, what I found was that sounds had a very clear sense of layering in the soundstage, so a drum kit was clearly behind, say, a vocalist, and then a guitarist might have been somewhere between the two and slightly off to the side. There was a really nice sense of image placement, and you could clearly hear the overall space in the soundstage was wide and deep, it just didn't have the razor sharp focus on say a vocalist, and it was generally the dead center sounds that were lacking a bit of that focus. Anything that was coming out of one speaker or the other predominantly, i.e. left or right panning, those things were really clearly focused. What I found was that the central vocals or central instrumentals, instead of being a pinpoint, were a bit of a wider block of sound, but it was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable for everything except absolute critical listening. And while we're speaking about the different types of listening, something else that really impressed me was that over the course of the two evenings I was at the launch, it was an event held over three different nights. What I found as I was there was I heard the speakers playing at multiple different volumes. And often speakers require a certain volume level to really come to life. But I felt with the FR30s, they actually sounded fantastic at low and moderate volumes. The sorts of volumes where you can still have a conversation, but the music is loud enough that if you wanted to listen to it instead of having a conversation, you can do that too. So in other words, it wasn't background music, but it also wasn't loud enough that it was overpowering conversation. And I love the fact that they're a speaker that can be thoroughly enjoyable at any point in the volume range. And at no point in the volume range, even as they got louder, did they get shouty or aggressive in the top end. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. And they are a speaker that if I were in a position to have a pair of large passive speakers, I would absolutely consider. Perhaps more exciting to me though, is the fact that PS Audio will be producing other models. So the FR30 is gonna be their second from the top of the range. There'll be a bigger one in the future, as well as two smaller ones they expect. There'll also sometime down the track be a subwoofer, and I'm really interested to see how that sort of setup performs. And the reason for that is I'm a huge fan of what I heard from the planar magnetic mid-range and tweeter setup. The woofers to me are woofers. They might be wonderfully designed. I do believe the PS Audio have gone to great lengths to make sure they're fast and they're as phase accurate as possible and all of those things. But for me, the magic in the sound from the FR30s comes from that planar magnetic mid-range and tweeter setup. It just makes for a wonderful, engaging and transparent sound. And so for those like me that don't have the space for a big pair of speakers, the idea of having a speaker with those qualities paired up with a subwoofer somewhere in the room is very, very appealing. And finally, while we're talking about the planar magnetic mid-range and tweeter setup, you might have noticed in Peter's address that he spoke about a rear-firing planar magnetic driver as well. After the event was over, I asked Peter if we could fiddle around with that driver to see what it was capable of doing at different volume levels, switching it off entirely, putting it all the way up to maximum, and then finding what we thought was a more optimal position. And I was really interested to hear that with that rear-facing driver switched off entirely, the sound was still good. But there was no doubt in my mind that when it was switched on, it did definitely improve the sense of depth and layering in the soundstage. The overall sense of space, basically, I think turned up to full, at least in the space that we had it, where it was probably about two meters from the wall, maybe a little bit less than that. I think in that amount of space, having the rear firing drivers on full was just a bit too much. It added a tiny sense of kind of edge or glare to the sound. But when Peter pulled it back to what he thought and what I agree was the optimal setting, it just managed to make the music come alive more without in any way changing the tonality or the enjoyment of the music. It just made that wonderful sense of space come more to life. And so to sum up my impressions and the impressions that I gathered from many of you who attended the event, and by the way, it was wonderful to meet you all. I had a great time chatting to a number of you that are viewers of the channel. So thank you for your time. Thanks for saying hi. It seemed to me the consensus from most people at the event and me included, was that the FR30s are a fantastic speaker for those wanting a very high-end music reproduction that doesn't require you to sit in a single space and never move a muscle. There are no doubt speakers on the market that are more immediately impressive, that may become across a bit more snappy and dynamic, 
but having lived with speakers like that in the past when I did have a lot of speakers, those sorts of speakers can also get a bit fatiguing for day-to-day -day use. And so I think what PS Audio have produced here is a speaker that is very enjoyable across a wide range of genres in any listening situation. I'd equate them to something like a Grand Tourer if we're using a car analogy. They're a high performance car that's gonna be comfortable for long trips, or in this case, long listening sessions. Of course, some people are looking for more of the hypercar experience where you're gonna feel every lump and bump for that absolute maximum razor's edge precision and performance but you're not gonna to wanna to live with that car as your day-to-day -day driver or for a long trip. And that to me is the choice that PS Audio have made is to choose that long-term wonderful listening enjoyment over maybe that absolute pinnacle of performance that comes back to bite you sometimes or maybe doesn't suit every situation that you wanna use it in. If I was to draw this to a headphone analogy because that's clearly an area of comfort for me, I actually found the FR30s reminded me the most of something like the Meza Elite which just also happens to be my daily driver headphone. Admittedly, I do sometimes reach for the hi and Susvara for that absolute razor edge precision, but that's not the headphone I reach for for my day-to-day -day listening across a wide range of tracks, because it's not consistently enjoyable. The elites though are, and so are the FR30s in my opinion. Now as always, this is a hobby with personal preferences and personal tastes. And so there were people at the event that weren't so impressed with the speakers. I don't think anyone thought they were bad, but some people weren't blown away by them, and that's totally, totally fair. That's why there's so many brands and so many models and designs on the market. So I'm not sitting here for a second suggesting the FR30s are for everybody, but if you enjoy a wide range of genres and you like to enjoy them whilst getting on with your life rather than sitting and critically listening, I do think the FR30s are absolutely worth checking out. I also think if the FR30s look too big to you, then it's also worth keeping an ear to the ground, maybe join a mailing list somewhere to find out about the new models when they come out. I'm certainly going to be following them with a lot of interest to see when the smaller units that I could actually fit in my house are going to be coming down the pipeline. And so I'm going to wrap things up there. Hopefully you found this review useful. Hopefully it's given you a taste of what to expect from the FR30s if you're interested in them. If you're here in Melbourne or you're planning to come to Melbourne for the Melbourne International Hi-Fi Show, I do believe that the FR30s are going to be available for auditioning once again at Hey Now Hi-Fi. So make sure you check out how to get access to those auditions and come and have a listen for yourself. If you do, I'd love it if you'd come back here, post in the comments, and let us know what you thought of the speakers after you've taken a listen. I also want to close things out with a huge thanks once again to the team from Magenta Audio and also Jeff from Hey Now Hi-Fi for making the launch possible and having me come along to take a listen for myself. As always, if you found this video useful or enjoyable, I'd love it if you'd hit like, subscribe, ring the notification bell to make sure that you see more content like this from me. And I say more content like this, I don't expect to be doing any more speaker reviews in the short term, other than maybe some studio monitors I might have coming up. But I've always got lots of other content coming up, including headphones, in-ear monitors, DACs, headphone amps, which are also preamps, of course. I've got lots of other content coming. So hit that subscribe button if you're interested. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. But for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.